"'You will observe,' said Holmes, laying down the volume, "'that the sudden breaking up of the society was coincident with the disappearance of Openshaw from America with their papers. It may well have been cause and effect. It is no wonder that he and his family have some of the more implacable spirits upon their track. You can understand that this register and diary may implicate some of the first men in the South, and that there may be many who will not sleep easy at night until it is recovered. Then the page we have seen is such as we might expect. It ran, if I remember right, sent the pips to A, B, and C, that is, sent the society's warning to them. Then there are successive entries that A and B cleared, or left the country, and finally that C was visited, with, I fear, a sinister result for C. Well, I think, Doctor, that we may let some light into this dark place, and I believe that the only chance young Openshaw has in the meantime is to do what I have told him. There is nothing more to be said or to be done to-night, so hand me over my violin, and let us try to forget for half an hour the miserable weather, and the still more miserable ways of our fellow men. It had cleared in the morning, and the sun was shining with a subdued brightness through the dim veil which hangs over the great city. Sherlock Holmes was already at breakfast when I came down. "'You will excuse me for not waiting for you,' said he. "'I have, I foresee, a very busy day before me in looking into this case of young Openshaw's. "'What steps will you take?' I asked. "'It will very much depend upon the results of my first inquiries. I may have to go down to Horsham, after all.' "'You will not go there first? "'No. I shall commence with the city. Just ring the bell, and the maid will bring up your coffee.' As I waited, I lifted the unopened newspaper from the table, and glanced my eye over it. It rested upon a heading which sent a chill to my heart. "'Holmes!' I cried. You are too late. Ah, said he, laying down his cup, I feared as much. How was it done? He spoke calmly, but I could see that he was deeply moved. My eye caught the name of Openshaw, and the heading Tragedy Near Waterloo Bridge. Here is the account. Between nine and ten last night, Police Constable Cook, of the H Division, on duty near Waterloo Bridge, heard a cry for help and a splash in the water. The night, however, was extremely dark and stormy, so that, in spite of the help of several passers-by, it was quite impossible to effect a rescue. The alarm, however, was given, and by the aid of the water police the body was eventually recovered. It proved to be that of a young gentleman whose name, as it appears from an envelope which was found in his pocket, was John Openshaw and whose residence is near Horsham. It is conjectured that he may have been hurrying down to catch the last train from Waterloo Station, and that in his haste and the extreme darkness he missed his path and walked over the edge of one of the small landing-places for river steamboats. The body exhibited no traces of violence, and there can be no doubt that the deceased had been the victim of an unfortunate accident which should have the effect of calling the attention of the authorities to the condition of the riverside landing stages. We sat in silence for some minutes, Holmes more depressed and shaken than I had ever seen him. "'That hurts my pride, Watson,' he said at last. "'It is a petty feeling, no doubt, but it hurts my pride. It becomes a personal matter with me now, and if God sends me health, I shall set my hand upon this gang, that he should come to me for help, and that I should send him away to his death. He sprang from his chair, and paced about the room in uncontrollable agitation, with a flush upon his sallow cheeks, and a nervous clasping and unclasping of his long, thin hands. "'They must be cunning devils!' he exclaimed at last. "'How could they have decoyed him down there?' The embankment is not on the direct line to the station. The bridge, no doubt, was too crowded, even on such a night, for their purpose. Well, Watson, we shall see who will win in the long run. I am going out now. To the police? No, 
I shall be my own police. When I have spun the web, they may take the flies, but not before. All day I was engaged in my professional work, and it was late in the evening before I returned to Baker Street. Sherlock Holmes had not come back yet. It was nearly ten o'clock before he entered, looking pale and worn. He walked up to the sideboard, and tearing a piece from the loaf he devoured it voraciously, washing it down with a long draught of water. "'You are hungry,' I remarked. "'Starving! It had escaped my memory. I have had nothing since breakfast.' "'Nothing?' "'Not a bite. I had no time to think of it.' "'And how have you succeeded?' "'Well.' "'You have a clue?' "'I have them in the hollow of my hand. Young Openshaw shall not long remain unavenged. Why, Watson, let us put their own devilish trademark upon them. It is well thought of. What do you mean?' He took an orange from the cupboard, and tearing it to pieces he squeezed out the pips upon the table. Of these he took five and thrust them into an envelope. On the inside of the flap he wrote, S. H. for J. O. Then he sealed it, and addressed it to Captain James Calhoun, Bark Lone Star, Savannah, Georgia. "'This will await him when he enters port,' said he, chuckling. "'It may give him a sleepless night. He will find it as sure a precursor of his fate as Openshaw did before him.' "'And who is this Captain Calhoun?' "'The leader of the gang. I shall have the others, but he first. How did you trace it, then?' He took a large sheet of paper from his pocket, all covered with dates and names. "'I have spent the whole day,' said he, "'over Lloyd's registers and files of the old papers, following the future career of every vessel which touched at Pondicherry in January and February in '83. There were thirty-six ships of fair tonnage which were reported there during those months. Of these, one, the Lone Star, instantly attracted my attention, since, although it was reported as having cleared from London, the name is that which is given to one of the states of the Union. Texas, I think. I was not and am not sure which, but I knew that the ship must have an American origin. What then? I searched the Dundee records, and when I found that the bark Lone Star was there in January eighty-five, my suspicion became a certainty. I then inquired as to the vessels which lay at present in the port of London. Yes. The Lone Star had arrived here last week. I went down to the Albert Dock, and found that she had been taken down the river by the early tide this morning, homeward bound to Savannah. I wired to Gravesend, and learned that she had passed some time ago, and as the wind is easterly, I have no doubt that she is now past the Goodwins and not very far from the Isle of Wight. What will you do, then? Oh, I have my hand upon him. He and the two mates are, as I learn, the only native-born Americans in the ship. The others are Finns and Germans. I know also that they were all three away from the ship last night. I had it from the stevedore, who has been loading their cargo. By the time that their sailing ship reaches Savannah, the mail-boat will have carried this letter, and the cable will have informed the police of Savannah that these three gentlemen are badly wanted here upon a charge of murder. There is ever a flaw, however, in the best laid of human plans, and the murderers of John Openshaw were never to receive the orange pips which would show them that another— as cunning and as resolute as themselves, was upon their track. Very long and very severe were the equinoctial gales that year. We waited long for news of the lone star of Savannah, but none ever reached us. We did at last hear that somewhere, far out in the Atlantic, a shattered sternpost of a boat was seen swinging in the trough of a wave, with the letters L.S. carved upon it. And that is all which we shall ever know of the fate of the Lone Star. End of Adventure 5